Today, I want to talk with you about some recent economic data and what that data suggests regarding the state of labor relations and conflict resolution in the United States. And in particular, I want to focus on the data released a couple of weeks ago regarding the level of unionization in the U.S. with a particular focus on unionization in the private sector. And then I also want to talk about the um, uh, data that was released as well a few weeks ago regarding the rate of inflation uh, that's occurred in the United States, uh, not only in the last month, but over the last uh, six months or so, and what that suggest again about the state of labor relations. So first on unionization, as you may have uh, already read in the press, uh, the BLS in its annual reporting of uh, data regarding the level of unionization, the key uh, statistic there is the percentage of the workforce that is unionized. They also report the percent covered by collective bargaining agreements. And they do so for both the private sector and uh, public sector separately. And, and they also have other refinements and disaggregation of that data. But I'm, I'm going to focus on the uh, finding within the BLS data that the percentage of the workforce in the United States within the private sector that's unionized uh, did not change last year. It's at 6.0%. That, of course, is significantly down from what it was at its post-World War II peak in the early 1950s, where um, uh, roughly one-third of the workforce was uh, within unions, and even data from uh, as late as 1980 uh, showed uh, significantly higher levels of unionization. At that period, it was around 23% or so. Anyway, uh, uh, the surprise was that in the face of all the news coverage of unionization occurring at Starbucks, Amazon, and many other workplaces, you might have expected that the share of the workforce in the private sector that our union members would have would have grown, uh, potentially grown substantially, but at least uh, grown uh, somewhat. And again, the data show that that share hasn't grown. Now, looking more closely at the data, it shows that um, the number of workers within the private sector who are members of unions actually did increase. It increased by about 190,000. But the workforce also substantially grew. The, the number of workers in non-union settings uh, grew uh, uh, significantly as well to the point at which they canceled one another out and the percentage of the workforce that's uh, uh, members of unions actually didn't change at all. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the uh, press reports are interesting in covering, you know, contemporary events where labor seems to be more militant. Uh, there, it's, it's interesting that places like Starbucks and other service sectors, which traditionally had low levels of unionization, are seeing union activity. But again, you uh, must uh, keep that that keep in mind that in the aggregate, it still has not added up to uh, substantial growth or even minor growth in the share of the workforce uh, that are um, members of unions. Um, it's also the case that uh, at, at Starbucks, for example, and at that warehouse of Amazons in Staten Island that got organized, even though the workers joined uh, unions, they haven't been able to negotiate a first contract. Now, one question you might have is, is the, is the share of workers who uh, join unions uh, that don't get a first contract grown, in which case uh, one would say that even that the steadiness in the share of the workforce that are union members is an overstatement of union power? Well, we don't really know the answer to that question. I just remind you, uh, over the last uh, 25 years, there's been a, a number of research projects that have looked at the failure of uh, recently unionized workforces to gain first contracts. And the research evidence shows that the, it's around 35 to 40 percent of unionized workers uh, after three or four years uh, of data tracking still don't have a first contract. 
So even though we have these noteworthy uh, cases like Starbucks and that Amazon warehouse where uh, workers haven't got a first contract, we don't know if, if that's representative of a broader uh, trend. Perhaps, but maybe not. Maybe one would just realize that that workers have uh, always had difficulty in the United States gaining a first contract. And in some cases, uh, they still don't, but it's not clear that's that uh, has increased markedly. But anyway, I too was somewhat surprised when the aggregate data came out, just to remind you about the key point that shows that unionization in the private sector uh, is not growing in terms of uh, the share of the workforce that are members of unions, even in the face of all the press reports about new organizing drives. The other data that, that came out that I found of interest uh, is uh, data reporting on the rate of inflation in, in, in the United States. And it shows, as you've read in the press, a, a significant slowing of the rate of inflation uh, down to the point at which over the last six months, uh, depending on the indicator, but it looks like inflation's running somewhere between two and 3%. Uh, the PCE uh, shows about a 2.5% uh, increase uh, uh, rate of inflation uh, uh, over the last six months. Um, uh, and, and what I'd like to sort of point out that, that accompanied that report was the rate of increase in wages uh, for the U.S. economy over that period is uh, around 4.5%. Now, again, press reports uh, have been looking at some of the recent uh, noteworthy uh, strikes and collective bargaining, whether it was the Teamsters during the summer or the auto workers this fall um, or other uh, workers uh, where they've had substantial bargaining power, airline pilots or another one. They've had uh, really uh, substantial gains in wages and benefits, uh, more than a 4.5% rate of increase. But again, the, the data uh, tell us that those uh, increases, whether it's in auto or Teamster drivers at UPS, they're not representative of what's happening to workers more broadly. And, and the press reports can, can get us uh, uh, overly concerned about inflationary pressure. Keep in mind that the historical uh, a target goal uh, was to have workers gain uh, a 3% a year real wage increase uh, and increases on top of that that accounted for inflation. Uh, that was the, the gold standard, 3% real wage in increases. Well, uh, add the numbers up. We have a 2.5% rate of inflation uh, noteworthy, I should add, uh, productivity has been growing uh, significantly uh, in the last couple of quarters at a 3.2% rate. Now, again, in the last five years or so, uh, productivity wasn't growing as fast as that. But anyway, um, when you add up uh, uh, the rate of inflation in any, any kind of norm, uh, normal expectation regarding uh, productivity increase, um, workers uh, pay a 4.5% increase is by no means um, uh, excessive. Uh, in, in fact, it may even be falling behind the gold standard of, of a 3% uh, real uh, wage increase. So again, don't get carried away uh, by reading some of the uh, news stories which highlight union and worker gains, whether those uh, union or worker gains are in the level of unionization or whether they have to do with stories regarding the rate of wage increase and benefit improvement that are occurring in some collective bargaining uh, settlements. Uh, look at the national uh, data to uh, understand uh, what the broader patterns are. Well, anyway, that's what I've been thinking about. Maybe it goes back to the fact that I was uh, trained in my PhD training to look at macroeconomic uh, factors and, and, and not just uh, uh, individual cases. And I think we all ought to keep that in mind as we look at recent data. Anyway, uh, take care. And uh, I hope to talk to you again in, uh, next month in another director's update.